Good evening and thank you for joining us for the spotlight. I'm David Rose. 2023 is already off to the races, courtesy of one Devante Jackson and a late model, very expensive stolen SUV. Put the car in park. To catch him, a deputy almost got run over. Another risked his life to lay down spike strips. A patrol car was rammed. Watch out. Watch out. And they had to bring in a canine unit and Smokey, the Washington State Patrol's aerial surveillance plane, spending precious time to track him through tricky terrain, not to mention provide medical care to the suspect who suffered scrapes, bumps, and some minor bite marks. All of that just to apprehend one car thief. That arrest comes just days after another thief in that red car you see there refused to stop and took off in fight. The Washington State Patrol's plane on the scene again, able to help detectives track the vehicle to Federal Way. And that's when the Puget Sound Auto Theft Task Force moved in slowly in unmarked vehicles and pinned him in. But then he bolted from the car and took off running. Fortunately, officers were just as fast and were able to put him in cuffs. Well, the new year was hardly a few days old when police nabbed yet another suspected car thief, one you might recognize, known on the streets as Honda John. He's a prolific offender. I've been covering Honda John since 2018. He was arrested at the home where he lives with his mom in Puyallup, but it took a concerted effort. A team of DOC officers, U.S. Marshals, and a Pierce County Sheriff's detective had to force open the door to take Frank Kern, AKA Honda John, into custody. Detectives recovered three stolen vehicles, including a motorcycle. It was one of four stolen from a recent victim, along with a trailer. Kern's arrest comes after a neighbor recognized the stolen motorcycle posted on the PNW Stolen Cars Facebook page and contacted law enforcement. As we first showed you in 2021, all of the homes in this neighborhood have signs warning auto thieves that they are under video surveillance and to stay away. It's people's livelihoods, getting their kids to school. It's so much more than the materialistic of, oh, it's just a car. The Puget Sound Auto Theft Task Force says these neighbors have already helped them recover numerous stolen cars from Kern's property, something I asked him about in 2021. Is it fair that they're putting these signs in here and pointing fingers at you? No. Why not? Just hold my past against me and give me a sign. I'll put it in my front lawn. When officers arrested him this week, look what they found in his front yard, a sign supporting the Auto Theft Task Force. Detectives say he stole it from one of his neighbors. It's been a rough decade um, living next door to that. Kern was booked into the Nisqually Jail, where he's being held without bail. He still has two pending cases in Pierce County, including charges for burglary, theft, unlawful possession of a stolen vehicle, and reckless driving. Trial is scheduled for January 31st, but it's only a matter of time until he's back in this neighborhood. We're not blind, and we're not going to just turn our eye and walk away. Statewide in 2022, there were 45,033 vehicles stolen. That is a 78% increase over the last 15 years. So what's the solution? Well, critics of the police reform legislation that went into effect in 2021 say it has given the green light to criminals who know they don't have to stop for an officer who tries to pull them over. Even if the officer knows the car is stolen, the changes prevent them from doing anything about it unless they've established probable cause. Prior to 2021, they could pursue based on reasonable suspicion. Well, now Representative Eric Robertson has proposed a bill to roll back the 2021 changes so officers can once again arrest suspects and get your car back to you. You represent the 31st Legislative District. So that is a lot of people in South King County, a lot of people in Pierce County. I moments ago got the latest auto theft numbers for the year from the Auto Theft Task Force. Pierce County had 9,631 vehicles stolen in 2022. And King County was even worse, 16,505 vehicles stolen in 2022. Every one of those vehicles has somebody who needed it probably to get to work, take their kids to school. I mean, it's not just a stolen car. Police pursuits and the lack of the ability to do that because they have to establish probable cause over reasonable suspicion has led to criminals feeling emboldened. And many detectives and victims tell me they feel like that legislation has caused these auto theft numbers to spike. Your bill to roll back some of the changes in that legislation could make a huge difference. What are the changes that you're calling for in this legislative session? Probably the most important thing, as you pointed out, 
they changed it in 2021 to where it requires probable cause. Um, that was a change in standard from uh, previously where it was reasonable suspicion. Uh, the reasonable su suspicion standard had been in place for years. Um, and, and the probable cause, quite frankly, is a charging standard uh, for court. So police officers rarely have that uh, level of uh, proof when they're when they're going after a bad guy. And <clears throat> what this would do is return it back to uh, the reasonable suspicion standard, allow law enforcement officers out in the community to uh, detain people and investigate um, crimes. And that includes uh, stopping them. And, and sometimes you have to pursue them because criminals don't always stop for uh, the, the blue lights that are behind them. Um, and it's become unfortunate. It's uh, uh, become a, a shift to where the criminals are now in control instead of the law enforcement officers who are sworn to protect our community being in control because they just have to stand back and allow uh, bad things to happen, sometimes right in front of them. And we've seen you know, videos uh, from body cam and 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 uh, patrol car cams that have demonstrated how uh, this is really being taken advantage of and and how important it is uh, that we that we change it back to reasonable suspicion. In your discussions, are you getting any support from the Democrats to be a little bit more reasonable, at least to take a serious look at making these changes based on what the public seems to want? Well, I, I honestly, the, the folks that I've talked to, they um, they have interest in it, but uh, nobody will sign on to it or or say that they'll support it. Kind of interesting, you know. Many many of them campaigned during this last year on fixing this, but nobody's willing to step up from the Democratic Party to sign on to that bill and or uh, promise at a hearing. What is your call to viewers? to help support this if they want this change made? Well, the first thing you need to do is get on your keyboard and uh, uh, write your legislators a note. Um, if you go to www.leg.wa.gov, uh, look up your legislator and send them a note and tell them to support and, and ask for the, the chairman of the committee to get it out of uh, the, the public safety committee and and for the speaker to move it to the floor of the house for a vote because uh, we can't continue to let brazen acts of criminal behavior uh you know ruin our our communities uh we we need to have a, a reasonable um solution and i think this is it we definitely want to keep this in front of the public eye because this is only going to get more serious as the uh, auto theft numbers have proven out thank you for your time today we appreciate it it's not just lawmakers, but the law enforcers seeking change. The Spotlight's John Hopperstadt heard from a police chief who says the pursuit policy, as it now stands, costs his community multiple times a day. A lot of people worried about the rise in crime in our communities, and police say criminals have actually become emboldened since those pursuit rule changes back in 2021, whether police are chasing criminals by foot or out on the roads, and that's why they're pushing to make a change in the next legislative session. Now, we first saw this come up during a deadly shooting in a Puyallup store parking lot in July of 2021. A Pierce County K-9 unit was dispatched, but because of these new policing laws, they had to pull the dog and the deputy back because they didn't have probable cause to make the search. Puyallup's police chief says that was a red flag, and he has seen the situation get worse over the last couple of years. He says, We've lost sight of victims of crime who often witness burglaries and robberies and then watch as police are not allowed to pursue those criminals. And we usually have anywhere from three to four cars during a shift that do not stop for us anymore, that just simply continue to drive off. Uh, and they are everything from burglaries to businesses, people trying to rip ATMs out of the banks or off the ground or actually burglarizing businesses to traffic violators, to hit and runs, to uh, assault suspects, uh, you name it, it's across the board. And it's across the board because, again, uh, the criminal element is well aware that in Washington state, law enforcement is not able to pursue you. And I'm not advocating, John, that we be able to uh, and shouldn't pursue everybody all the time, but we've lost sight of the decision-making, the local control issue, 
and that now you've created a system where we really have forgotten about victims of crime. Chief Engel isn't the only one who wants to see a change. In a new video, several mayors and sheriffs are calling for a change to these police reform laws, calling on the public to actually contact legislators and encourage them to loosen up police pursuit rules, changing it from requiring a probable cause to reasonable suspicion. Representative Roger Goodman of Kirkland was one of the sponsors of that initial rules change back in 2021. He says, since it went into place, we've seen an 80% decrease in the number of deaths from police pursuits, but he also understands the call for change. He's hoping to bring all sides together to discuss this in the next legislative session. For the Spotlight, I'm John Opperstead in Seattle. The pursuit policy is just one of the legislative priorities for the new session gaveling in this week. Several lawmakers from both sides of the aisle, along with Governor Inslee, gave a preview of what they'll be working on over the next 105 days in Olympia. And the spotlight's Nia Wong was there. The economy, public safety, and homelessness are the top issues for Washington voters. That's according to a crosscut Elway poll conducted last week. Legislators across the aisle agree the key to addressing those top concerns and more is the workforce. It's a huge issue that flows across every single sector that we talk about and that any solution that we suggest involves workforce. Legislators also stressed how the workforce and economy are connected to education. Rep J.T. Wilcox says there's a crisis coming. And we are seeing in our school systems declining enrollment. That's going to end up becoming declining revenues as well. Lawmakers touched on loan forgiveness, tuition help, removing barriers to licensing as possibilities, and they're open to innovation. We want to see um, government agencies, private business, we want to see that creativity and we want to support that creativity. As they seek solutions for the long term, they're also paying attention to the struggles of today with families suffering under inflation. And now we're looking at a recession coming. So I, if we, this is the time to do a, a substantial and meaningful tax relief for the people of Washington. Housing and homelessness is on the minds of many Washingtonians. Today, Governor Inslee spoke on his proposed $70 billion budget, which focuses on housing. I've proposed a $4 billion proposal to increase in housing, uh, accompanied uh, by necessary support services in mental health and chemical addiction reduction that is necessary to actually move the, the needle for, forward on homelessness. He's asking state legislators to pass this proposal so it can go before voters as a referendum in November. Homelessness played a big part in Seattle's first homicide of the new year. The story broke January 2nd in the South Lake Union neighborhood. The Spotlight's AJ Janabel reports the murder happened at the Downtown Emergency Service Center's Canada House. And coming out of a violent 2022, Seattle police say they are looking to make a change this year. Monday night, responding Seattle police cars light up the murder scene at the Canada House on Minor Avenue. Court documents say the 911 call came from a resident who told police that his neighbor knocked on his door and said, quote, he had killed a woman. Police showed up at the 46-year-old suspect's apartment, and here's what they say they found. The suspect wearing only pants, the body of a 51-year-old woman who was naked from the waist down and had been stabbed a bloody knife, and a pipe, which officers believe is used to smoke crack or meth. The suspect who hasn't been charged at this time is a sex offender out of Texas, according to documents. And according to those documents, detectives believe there may have been a sexual motivation behind what happened. Both the victim and suspect lived in the Canada House. The apartment is run by the Downtown Emergency Service Center, a group who works to end homelessness. DESC's website says the Canada House provides 83 studio units of permanent supportive housing and 25 units for vets. This is the first murder of the year for Seattle. The city is rebounding from a very violent 2022. Fox 13 News spoke with Seattle Police Chief Adrian Diaz recently about crime in the city. Community needs to be involved, needs to be engaged. When you don't have as many officers, uh, we've got to really work tightly with the community to be able to solve these cases. An arrest in one of the country's most talked about crimes, the brutal slayings of four University of Idaho students. Coming up, we know how police said the suspect did it, but not why. I'll talk with a police profiler, a criminal expert who solved hundreds of homicides, and get his thoughts about whether this suspect would have been the next Ted Bundy.
Weeks of rabid online rumors and guesswork by an army of armchair sleuths has finally given way to an actual arrest and court appearance in the University of Idaho murders. Brought about by concrete evidence, pages and pages of it. The affidavit in this case contained never before revealed information about the killings of those four college students. And it shows how police narrowed their search to just one man. And that man, Brian Koberger, came before a judge to hear how his life now hangs in the balance. The maximum penalty for that offense, if you plead guilty or are found guilty, is up to death and or imprisonment for life. Do you understand? Yes. Brian Koberger looked alert as he listened to the charges against him, including felony burglary and four counts of first degree murder, with the victim's names and associated charges read one by one. The defendant, Brian C. Koberger, on or about November 13th of 2022 in Lake County, State of Idaho, did willfully, unlawfully, deliberately, with premeditation and with malice of forethought, kill and mur murder Kaylee Gonsalves, a human being, by stabbing Kaylee Gonsalves, from which she died. Some members of the victim's friends and family gasped and wept as the names and charges were read. In violation of Idaho Code 18-4001, 4002, 4003, 4004. When Brian first entered the courtroom, he greeted his defense attorney with a brief smile. The judge later finding him eligible for a public defender. I have court-appointed counsel. Koberger's attorney did ask the court to set a bond, adding that he had a big family that supported him. County prosecuting attorney Bill Thompson argued against the request. He was arrested 3,000 miles away across the country. We're examining if he can ask that he remain in custody. I am going to leave uh, the bail set at this case as no bail at this point in time. An attorney for the Kaylee Gonsalves family explained what it was like to see Koberger in court for the first time. It's obviously an emotional time for the family seeing the defendant for the first time. Um, this is the beginning of the criminal justice system and the family will, will be here for the long haul. What didn't come out in court? A connection. Did police determine if the victims even knew Koberger? Did they discover a possible motive? And why was a key piece of evidence left at the crime scene? The answers to those questions remain redacted, part of the sweeping gag order from the judge. But I spoke with a former local homicide detective turned crime profiler. He has some theories about these murders and the man who allegedly committed them. Kaylee Gonsalves, Madison Mogan, Zana Kernodal, and Ethan Chapin, four friends returning together to a rented Moscow, Idaho home after enjoying a college night out. At 4 a.m. November 13th, they were unwinding in their rooms, ordering a food delivery, looking at their phones, but they were also being watched. That's according to the affidavit police unsealed today. Security cameras on houses around the neighborhood recorded a white sedan suspect vehicle number one, later determined to be a Hyundai Elantra, as it made an initial three passes by the victim's home. Then it's seen entering the area a fourth time at approximately 4 a.m. The timeline shifts inside the home, drawn from the statement of a surviving roommate identified as DM, who lived on the same floor as Cronodal. She was awoken at approximately 4 a.m. by what sounded like Gonsalves playing with her dog upstairs. A short time later, DM thinks she hears Gonsalves say something to the effect of, there's someone here. DM looked down the hall but didn't see anything. She then opens her door a second time when she heard what she thought was crying from Kernodal's room, followed by a man's voice saying, it's okay, I'm going to help you. Back outside, 4.17 a.m., a security camera next door picks up distorted audio of what sounded like voices or a whimper, followed by a loud thud and a dog barking. DM looks out her room one last time and sees a figure clad in black clothing, partially masked, five feet 10 or taller, athletically built with bushy eyebrows. She told police she froze in terror as he walked by to the back sliding door, then locked herself in a room. 4.20 a.m., suspect vehicle one is next seen departing the area at a high rate of speed. That afternoon, the house is swarming with crime scene investigators. They discover the victims all with gruesome stab wounds. Gonsalves' dog unharmed and something else. A tan leather knife sheath laying on the bed. It was stamped with the logo of a popular combat knife maker, K-Bar, and the U.S. Marine Corps seal. Like this example, widely available for sale online, the knife has yet to be recovered. Retired Seattle homicide detective Cloyd Steiger says Koberger wasn't prepared for the chaos that ensued when these attacks started. This reads to me like a rookie the first time, leaving the knife sheath there. What a huge thing. Why wouldn't you have that knife sheath on your belt? 
So you couldn't possibly leave it there. The Idaho State Lab later located a single source of male DNA left on the button snap of that knife sheath. Over the next several weeks, police found video showing an Elantra leaving the WSU campus the night of the murders. Then they're able to link it to Koberger. Cell phone records also show him near the victim's home on at least 12 separate dates leading up to the killings. The final piece of evidence was secured December 27th. Agents recovered the trash from the Koberger family residence in Pennsylvania to get a family DNA sample. The next day, the Idaho State Lab matched it to the DNA from the knife sheath. The two samples were related with at least 99.998% certainty. This is what's called YSTR DNA. The Y chromosome uh, passes down from all the males in the family. So male to my father to son, son to grandson, grandson to great grandson. It's the same YSTR all the way down. So they had this, uh, this DNA and they could show that he was of the same YSTR as the father at the house, which is huge. Steiger says it's possible Koberger had previous victims, but he thinks this was his first time. I, I don't know enough to know about him if he's a sociopath or a psychopath, um, but yeah, the boy ain't right, right? <laughs> I don't know. There's yeah. something going on here. Coming up, new year, new look for one of the deadliest drugs around. Fentanyl is taking a new form locally and with it the potential to kill even more people. The King County Sheriff's Office closed out 2022 with one of the biggest drug busts in its department's history. But while detectives may have kept $10 million worth of drugs off the streets, they say there are signs that we are already trending in the wrong direction for 2023, particularly when it comes to fentanyl powder. The six men arrested for their alleged involvement in a massive cartel operation in King County are set to be arraigned in January. They're accused of bringing in a significant amount of meth, heroin, and fentanyl. They could have uh, roughly overdosed everybody within King County. Among the most concerning was 25 pounds of fentanyl in powder form. Sergeant Corbett Ford of the King County Sheriff's Office says it doesn't take much to feel the drug's effects. You could easily take a, a gram of fentanyl powder and, and that would be anywhere from a, a, an overdose to a lethal amount of, of fentanyl. He says fentanyl powder can easily get into your system by smell or touch. The side of it found in last week's bus briefly fooled detectives. That they believed that they had found a significant amount of, of cocaine and it ended up being fentanyl powder. Not shocking to King County health officials. There's no way to eyeball the difference. Public Health Seattle and King County is weeks away from complaining its fatal drug overdose report for the year. But Brad Feingood says it's already seen a huge increase in fentanyl. We've actually seen uh, a higher uh, proportion of, of fentanyl included in powders than in the pills that have came into our community. If you see a substance that you don't recognize what it is, especially if it's a white powdery substance, don't touch it. Agencies are reminding the public that help is out there. While they recommend to have Narcan on hand. There are fentanyl test strips that people can use to test a substance to find out if there's fentanyl in it. With prevention being a crucial step to avoiding tragedy. It's really important to let your loved ones um, know that um, if you're going to be using substances so that they don't find you, unfortunately, with bad outcomes. That was the Spotlight's Nia Wong reporting. Well, still ahead, two of the faces we are happy to see in 2023. Faces that were both shot with a shotgun. So tonight we're putting the spotlight on two heroes, two Whatcom County Sheriff's deputies who are among the many returning to work in the new year. They both survived potentially crippling injuries, physically and mentally. The spotlight's Brisa Mendez finds out what motivated them to get back on duty after a violent call. It took me what seemed to me like several seconds to kind of work through the process of, well, if, if you're dead, why are you still thinking? Is, are you dead, is this the afterlife? Or um, is this the kind of thing where you've sustained a fatal injury and, and you know it, but your body hasn't given up yet? It's been nearly eight years since Whatcom County Sheriff's Deputy Jason Thompson came inches from death or permanent disability. February 10th, 2022, he and his partner Ryan Rathbin were trying to defuse a tense neighbor dispute in Peaceful yeah. Valley when shots ring out. My fear was that uh, the suspect was going to be coming out to uh, finish trying to kill Deputy Thompson or in, in, engage us in a gunfight. You know, the focus was on 
protecting him, myself, and the, the community. The man they were there to confront, 60-year-old Joel Young, had fired on them with a shotgun at close range. And I was hit in the face uh, and head, uh, full face and head. Um, still have pellets lodged in my uh, sinuses, in my skin, and various parts of my body. I had a broken nose, uh, multiple pellets in the forehead and face. Uh, one hit, uh, one ended up behind my eye, caused me to go blind in my left eye for several weeks. It was her partnership and sense of purpose which got them through that day. It's the community's outpouring of support which has brought them both back on duty, ready to once again protect and serve. People in this community do appreciate it, do love us, do do want and respect what we do. So that, for, for me, that was a big paradigm shift from uh, what's been going on over the last several years. And it's, I, I think that was great. I think that's one of the greatest things for me that's, that's come from this. Ryan and I both have something left to offer and to give um, and serve you know, our community and try, and try and return some of that good. And again, from all of us here at the Spotlight, we are so glad that both of you are okay and we appreciate your service. That's all the time we have on the Spotlight. Until next week, be smart and stay safe.